Alan, thank you so much for the introduction. Really appreciate it. I am here in New York City and my two daughters are tucked away elsewhere in the apartment here in Brooklyn. Um, so wherever you're joining us from, I uh, hope everybody's doing safe and well. Uh, my name is Daniel Seberg and I'm the Vice President of Technology and Innovation Thought Leadership with Huawei USA. The title of this presentation is Designing for Digital Inclusion and just sort of thinking through what you all are interested in and what you're doing. This is quite a, a broad topic, um, and, but also incredibly important um, as you all think about what you wanna do with your talents and skills and how you wanna apply them uh, with whatever you create uh, for the world and thinking sort of holistically and inclusively um, about what it is that people need and what they want and what they're gonna use. So. We'll get into some of what that might mean. Uh, we'll take some questions here at the end and appreciate everyone joining on a, on a Saturday. And I'm gonna start off though by talking about Huawei, which some of you may be familiar with, but would love to get into some of the history of Huawei and the, and the company itself and where it started and where we're going. So as some of you may know, Huawei is a, a leading global provider of information and communications technology infrastructure or ICT and, and smart devices. We have a huge consumer business group. The company, believe it or not, was founded way back in 1987 by a 42 year old starving entrepreneur, Mr. Rang Jing Fei. I can certainly relate to the idea of being a starving entrepreneur. Um, and he had a number of partners who were working with him, but they only had about $3,500 um, as founding capital. So modest, humble beginnings for what is now a, uh, a global company. Today, Huawei has about 197,000 employees worldwide and notably more than half of that workforce. So about 53.4% or 105,000 people are dedicated to R&D, to research and development. Um, which has always been the focus of the company and helped Huawei to get to where it is. Here we are, um, you know, from 1987 uh, to today, 33, 34 years later. Um, it really has been a direct result of that investment in thinking about the future. Um, Huawei is a private company. Uh, it's 100% owned by the employees. Um, in fact, over the past 30 years, uh, Mr. Ren has actually diluted almost all of his shares um, and given them to employees. Um, he now holds about 1% of the shares of the company. But you know, uh, as with most, and I would say many uh, entrepreneurial journeys, uh, Huawei's path to success was certainly not easy. Um, at the beginning, they could only sell equipment in rural Chinese towns and villages because the big cities were simply dominated by Western companies. They'd already arrived and started selling a lot of that ICT infrastructure. So around the year 2000, um, they were forced to go overseas because the Chinese market was simply too competitive and it was too hard to survive in that market. Uh, the first overseas contract that Huawei brokered was for less than $100, but it was something. Um, and as you're all thinking about maybe building your own companies or uh, working with others, you know, just those first dollars in sales can mean so much. It just helps to validate whatever it is that you're working on. And with the hard work and perseverance of employees uh, by 2020, so here we are just uh, last year, uh, Huawei's revenue reached $136 billion. So extraordinary gains and growth, but of course not without the tireless efforts of all of the people involved. Uh, Huawei now operates in more than 170 countries and regions and was recently ranked number 49 on the Fortune 500 list. So, as I mentioned, at the you know since the founding and the beginning of, of Huawei's origins, the idea of investing in R and D has been instrumental in achieving success. In fact, Huawei has invested at least ten percent of the revenue each year into R and D. So really, turning it back into the company, into the people, and thinking about what's next. Uh, for the last ten years or so. Uh, total R&D investment reached roughly $110 billion. Uh, in 2020 alone, the investment was almost $22 billion, if that gives you a sense of just the kind of year-over-year -year 
commitment to putting that money back into the company. And as a result of these investments, uh, Huawei has been granted more than 100,000 active patents, 90% uh, of which are invention patents. And cur currently Huawei holds the most 5G patents in the world. And as somebody who has spent some time in with software and with hardware, there's a reason they call it hardware, because it's hard. And the idea of creating patents and inventions in that space, and as you're all working on different designs, you know, the cliche of thinking outside the box. Um, these, are, these are important indicators of where Huawei sees itself in uh, pioneering new ideas and new concepts and not following anybody else, but really uh, instilling a sense of originality uh, in its employees. So connectivity, here we all are on a remote Zoom call. Uh, connectivity, arguably never more central and important uh, to the world at large, and of course, to everything that Huawei does. Um, one of the most important technologies that Huawei is involved in is 5G. Some of you may have a 5G enabled smartphone today. And of course, it's completely transforming so much of what we do. Virtually every aspect of the world will be in some ways affected by the development of 5G and you know, someday 6G, but let's talk about 5G for a second. So for consumers, 5G will deliver a peak speed that's about 100 times faster than 4G. So for example, uh, in Switzerland, Huawei's network can deliver up to 1.5 gigabits per second. Um, now you can live stream HD videos of the, uh, let's say the mountain slopes uh, while you're skiing. Um, so you can have that experience uh, sort of no matter where you are, as long as you have a signal. Um, in Korea, you can use your 5G smartphone to watch a live game from any angle you want. So a 360 degree view, um, that's possible with 5G. Um, you can also make your the camera follow your favorite player throughout the entire game. So a lot of sort of uh, innovative use cases, even within the applications where it's being put to use. Um, it's really designed to be a truly personalized experience. Um, AR and VR will, of course, become increasingly prevalent, um, providing this kind of uh, immersive experience to consumers while also uh, reducing the cost uh, per bit of, of transmitting all of that data. Now, in the home, uh, connecting the unconnected and providing faster broadband are the key goals of 5G commercialization, because I think a lot of times we imagine how it's maybe being used by consumers or in a personal way. Um, but of course, there are different ways that industries uh, of all kinds are thinking about this. And, you know, worldwide, about 950 million homes still have no broadband connections, and 80% of those that are connected still need faster speed. And, you know, we're all here, we are affected by the pandemic in different ways. It has clearly shown how important it is to provide high-speed connectivity to every home, and 5G can ideally help to solve this problem quickly. Uh, so you can maybe rely on 5G as kind of your connectivity solution uh, in, in, in its entirety. And now, as for the B2B market, I mentioned, I mentioned industries. Uh, they're actively embracing 5G as 5G can help them improve efficiency and reduce costs. Um, I'll, I'll use the media industry as an example. So I'm sure you've all seen uh, the idea of bro live broadcast trucks or, or buses from TV stations. Um, they cost millions of dollars to maintain and to run and to set up. Um, and they often take days to, to set up. So eight months ago, um, we were able to condense all that into a backpack. So a single individual can carry it uh, and do the job. Um, three months ago, the backpack was further reduced to a pocket-sized device. Um, and today, the truckload of technology that's been integrated, all that technology has been integrated into the chipset of the 5G video camera itself. So it's able to power the same type um, of quality, uh, of course, in a much smaller rig or setup. Um, and, you know, Huawei has actually started working on 5G way back in 2009. And as part of that R&D investment has invested roughly $4 billion over all those years. Um, and, uh, you know, needless to say, we are excited to see how 5G is making this kind of impact uh, in our world. So when it comes to social impact, and as you're thinking about designing for inclusion, and what are the social issues um, that you may want to address or to tackle or to incorporate into whatever it is that you're imagining, 
Um, you know, when it comes to social impact, an effort with Huawei, what we call Tech for All, is a major global initiative. Um, it's designed to be aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, Huawei uh, does not simply pursue technological advances, by the way. Um, we're more interested in the social value that can be created by the technology. So what is the impact rather than just something that seems kind of cool and different? Um, how is it actually benefiting people's lives? And that's why we wanna make long-term nonprofit investments uh, to ensure the sustainability of digital inclusion and the idea of leaving no one behind. So Tech for All's goal is to help uh, another 500 million people benefit from digital technology in the next five years. We work with global partners uh, such as UN agencies, NGOs, uh, research institutes, governments, uh, and businesses to promote the idea of digital inclusion. And we focus on four high impact domains supporting equal access to high quality education, which of course, during the pandemic, we have all come to appreciate what it means to um, be able to allow for remote schooling. Um, my two daughters have depended on it, even with a blended learning uh, here in New York City. Um, but there are many, many families, uh, both in the United States and elsewhere, that are not able to uh, access that. Um, and of course, that's foundational for the development of uh, any child, of course, for a country, um, just thinking about what it means to allow for that connectivity and designing for that type of inclusion. Um, there's also the our fragile environment, as we know, uh, climate change is an ever increasingly important issue for all of us to be thinking about and something that Huawei is committed to. Um, there's a fantastic project called uh, Rainforest Connection, um, which is a, an independent nonprofit run by a guy named Topher White. And Huawei has worked with Topher over the years to provide, um, I want to say, repurposed Huawei phones um, that are linked together uh, in, in the rainforests in South America and places like Brazil. And those phones are... Uh, what they're able to do is use the microphones in those phones, run it through an AI algorithm and detect the sound of chainsaws that are happening around where those phones are set up and then send that data to people who are able to go out and essentially um, police those parts of the rainforest and ensure that you know nobody's doing any illegal logging or anything like that. Um, so it's a fantastic way of thinking about, um, in this case, uh, technology that is it's maybe not as cutting edge anymore, but being applied to uh, an important issue of our time. Um, but as you're thinking about designing for any uh, challenge or any issue, what are the ways that uh, the, the sort of cutting edge technology can be applied, but also thinking about maybe uh, old ideas are new again, or um, just remembering that you know there are lots of ways to incorporate technology that maybe isn't as on the bleeding edge. Um, and then we also work on promoting uh, health and well-being, um, and ensuring that people can approach life with this idea of balanced uh, development and thinking through what that means. So how does Huawei design with digital inclusion in mind? Let's get into some of that. So here's an example. Uh, back in 2018, using AI and augmented reality, uh, we created something called StorySign which is the world's first literacy platform for deaf children. Uh, learning of, to read can of course be difficult for any child for any number of reasons, um, but for small children who are severely or profoundly deaf, it can be an overwhelming challenge both for them uh, and for the parents. And using our technology, uh, we aim to help, help to open the realm of uh, books to 32 million deaf children around the world and introduce them to this uh, world of imagination, curiosity, and creativity. And there's nothing like seeing children get immersed uh, into a book, um, particularly as maybe they felt uh, locked out of that experience uh, when they see their peers um, who are learning to read around them. Um, there's video of this uh, online if you ever want to check it out. It's a pretty emotional experience to, to witness this uh, in action. Uh, StorySign is a free app that helps deaf children read and it translates the, the text from selected books into sign language. And through the power of AI and augmented reality, 
uh, story sign brings these books to life and helps enjoy, helps the, the deaf children enjoy story time um, as every child should. Although I still have to ask my daughters to read more often than they do. Um, and they can hear me just fine, even though they pretend not to sometimes. Um, so connectivity, let's just sort of talk about, about that for a second and what it means to inclusivity. You know, connectivity is arguably a, a human right, um, as well as the cornerstone of economic progress. It's hard to imagine a, a society or a, uh, a, a village right through to a, a major metropolitan city that could possibly keep up with the needs of its citizenry or uh, what it is that people are consuming and doing and requiring in their life without this cornerstone of economic progress. Um, however, uh, GSMA reports that more than 700 million people in the world remain unconnected. And of course, this is where the term uh, digital divide comes in. And wherever you are in the world, there is a number of reasons why this is happening, whether it has to do with uh, public policy or cost, access, education, um, and the types of digital divides are also quite mixed. So I think when people often hear digital divide, the first thing they imagine is, well, it has to do with geography. Maybe people who live in parts of the country where there aren't as many cell towers or aren't as many internet providers, that that means that they're among the people who are suffering from the digital divide. And that is certainly true. However, there are other populations that are worth considering. And as you're thinking about digital designing for inclusion, it's easy to, to allow our own unconscious bias to creep into what we assume are the issues or what we assume are the reasons that something's happening. So for example, the digital divide could pertain to people of different ethnicities, people of different economic, uh, socioeconomic factors. Uh, age is another one. You know, uh, I'm guessing that some of you have, have come across this, but during the pandemic, for example, uh, particularly here in New York City, where there is a sizable part of the population who are uh, Spanish speakers, uh, that's maybe their native language. And when they are asked to now go and get the vaccine, perhaps, for them, it can be challenging to uh, put aside whether they can sort of, you know, understand the, the, the process, if you will, particularly if this is an, an aging uh, part of the Hispanic population. Um, so just simply being able to kind of book their appointment or know where to go. And then do they have the connectivity and the device that allows them to uh, interact with it in a way that is valuable to them and, and results in what they're after. So there are lots of different kind of segments, if you will, uh, within the digital divide. So it's, it's important to keep in mind, um, you know, and many of these people do live in hard to reach remote areas where it's impractical or too expensive to connect them. So to help bridge this digital divide, as an example, in rural Nigeria, Huawei teamed up with a local carrier to bring connectivity to the remote village of Tubolo. And this connectivity can actually mean the difference between life and death. So for example, instead of traveling to nearby towns to ask doctors to visit the village, the community can now call or text them, saving time and lives and anybody familiar with uh, the needs of healthcare or hospitals or doctors will know that time is absolutely often the difference between somebody uh, surviving something and not. So those even seconds and minutes can be can be precious. Um, Rural Star uh, applies wireless backhaul technology. So this is sort of on the back end that doesn't require line of sight to link to other nodes, which means they can be not within where you might see the other tower. They're a little bit hidden, uh, making it perfect for challenging terrain. So for example, like deserts or mountainous regions uh, and rural valleys. So when you think about a geography where people might be part of this digital divide, it's not just that they're far apart, it's that the topography of the earth is perhaps preventing them from having this better connectivity. So these are sort of unique challenges to think about. And you know, in practice, um, by connecting them in this way through something like Rural Star, it means that people that it can work. People can go to work, um, you know, wherever they are. They can they can remote work, and they don't have to worry necessarily about traveling, which, as we know, during the pandemic has been particularly necessary. And the simplicity of the system um, means that a node can be built in less than seven days, and that cuts the setup costs and time by about seventy percent. 
Uh, its footprint is also quite minimal. Um, Rural Star consumes no more energy than about five light bulbs. So important for the environment as well. And since 2017, Rural Star has been deployed in more than 110 networks globally, benefiting millions of people in rural areas with digital tech and many of them for the first time. So I mentioned a little bit about the consumer business, but I just wanna to touch on kind of what we're up to and where that's headed. And I'll give you an example about designing for digital inclusion in a second um, that does have to do with uh, mobile devices. Um, so an important area of course for Huawei is the consumer business, uh, you know, in a rather uh, short time period, uh, you know, when Huawei first began in 1987, it was not focused on uh, consumer business uh, with devices. It was basically all about ICT infrastructure. Uh, but in a rather short time period, Huawei entered the consumer electronics market, launching smartphones, laptops, tablets, wearables, and more. I'm sure you've seen uh, some of them. Um, the business has been very successful and it, it continues to grow at a very fast rate. However, uh, we're not just focused on growth. Um, we're focused on innovation and a vision for the future. And of course, the future, as time goes on, starts to look a little different. And what we know of the future, what we know of different populations, what we know of uh, migration and the changes in you know whatever is happening where people live, the way that the world looks in 2021 is of course very different than the way that it looked in 1987. And not only are there more people and they're sort of differently dispersed throughout the globe, um, but we, we can know more about them. There's more data, there's more of an opportunity to understand who it is that we should be thinking about um, as we're designing anything. And of course, that's an important lesson for any designer is to just think about that audience, you know, who is that persona, who is that person that you're designing for um, and putting them front and center in the beginning. Um, and, you know, as an example uh, of thinking about that future vision, to play on a bit of a, a pun here, Huawei played a huge role in pushing smartphone photography forward through a strategic partnership with Leica, um, which has been around for many years, I want to say decades even as a as a camera manufacturer and making the rather exclusive professional grade photography available to hundreds of millions of people so in this way when you think about what people use their smartphones or their personal devices for i would argue that most of us use them a lot of the time maybe most of the time for taking pictures now the cameras in them are pretty great generally but if you want to have the best one, or maybe even turn it into something of a small business for yourself, or you're an influencer, or you want to take great pictures of your family or whatever it is. We've all had smartphone cameras that we got frustrated with, or it didn't work in some way or whatever it was. So we wanted to ensure that the best cameras were involved with Huawei smartphones and that people had a fantastic experience. And as many people as possible could have access to this type of high-end photography. Um, we were also one of the first companies to launch a uh, a foldable smartphone, which I will show you here in just a second. Um, and last year we introduced a new operating system called Harmony OS uh, that's giving developers more opportunities for collaboration and consumers more choice. And just to go back to that example of designing for inclusion, digital inclusion, um, when I was working at Google, um, there was a story about how uh, the YouTube um, team was creating just back, this is, you know, several years ago, but at the time people were just thinking about more sort of uh, mobile uploads um, to their YouTube channel. So, uh, you know, in the early days of YouTube, of course, most people were doing it on their desktop. Um, but then as mobile phones became more popular, um, there was a need to think about what that experience was like um, where people were doing it on their mobile phone. So if you're like me and you're right-handed, when you go to record a video, you hold it with your right hand, presumably. And then you go to upload it to your YouTube channel and the video looks a certain way. And the YouTube design team was receiving all of these complaints from people and they were seeing all these videos that were being uploaded that were upside down. And they couldn't figure out what was going on until they really looked more closely at the data and started to think about how to correlate it to just society at large. And what they realized was about 10% of the videos were upside down. And of course, you've probably figured out by now it's because it was people who were left-handed. So they were recording the videos 
with a landscape mode that was different than the way it would be if it was in your right hand and then uploading them and it was upside down and they were super frustrated. So there's another segment of the population to think about um, just as you're remembering to incorporate the idea of our, our unconscious bias, if you will. Uh, we all have it on some level. And you know, as you think about who you wanna work with and what you wanna do, uh, including as much diversity as possible into that ideation process can be incredibly foundational and important for the long term, even if it takes some extra work um, at the beginning. So we want to ensure that developers that are working on Harmony OS are given lots of opportunities for uh, collaboration to work with people that they feel like are uh, adhering to their values and their ethics and their intentions with design. And by extension, uh, giving consumers more choices. And you can see these are the foldable phones. You know, Huawei has actually been researching uh, foldable phones for years. Um, and one of the, our greatest achievements um, is the Falcon Wing Hinge. So back to hardware for a second, um, it allows the screen to fold and unfold smoothly. Uh, the tiny hinge, which you can just see there, is, believe it or not, actually comprised of more than 100 precision cut pieces, uh, including a supporting mechanism, a rotating shaft, and a mechanism that helps to guide the movement. Uh, quite different, of course, than say the hinge on your door. Uh, there's a lot to this hinge that's allowing it to, to be folded and unfolded repeatedly to survive the wear and tear, to make it an enjoyable experience and to provide value for whatever it is that you're doing with your phone. Because of course, design should help to solve something or provide something, uh, not just because we can all go, ah, oh, gee whiz. And the design of the hinge also ensures that the flexible screen will not overstretch while folding or bulge when folded, something that the designers had to think about uh, all of these different factors as they were working through it. And it's also artistically crafted to dissolve into the device so that when you fold it open, uh, it's smooth and has a flat finish on both sides. Um, the Huawei Mate 10 uh, smartphone or Mate X, which uses the Falcon Wing hinge, uh, became an instant hit um, after it debuted in 2019. So one of those kind of uh, device envy uh, products out there. So that's it for, for my presentation. And at this point, would love to answer any questions that people have. And again, appreciate you spending some time with, with me and us here on Saturday. Awesome, thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and just um, you know speak out, ask your question. Uh, or if it's easier, you can also leave your question in the chat. Hi, I found your talk to be really interesting, especially with the end when you were talking about the foldable smartphones. I think I remember seeing it in like a TV show somewhere where it just seemed really cool. I was wondering what you guys were envisioning for the potential applications for this. Like, why would it like revolutionize say like smartphone technology? You know, I think there are still uh, ways that we're thinking about how it could revolutionize the way that people engage with their content. I mean, there are perhaps ways to think about it from a work in, uh, you know, um, environment. Let's say you have two different screens and you're able to show them both and sort of work on them simultaneously a bit like you do with your desktop. Um, the foldable feature allows it to sit and you can view it in a way that is perhaps um, useful for, for different content. Um, it allows you to sort of see something, uh, of course, on a bigger screen, um, which just gives you more real estate, whether it's for media or for uh, something that you're doing with it for, for business purposes. Um, you know, I think with any type of new technology, I think one of the ways that, um, you know, D designers in particular can can continue to innovate and, and iterate is to just see what other people are doing. You know, I think in the beginning, uh, companies or startups do their best to think about solving for X. You know, what is it that we're doing and why? But the reality is that no startup or uh, no company can possibly think of all the use cases for something when it goes out into the market. Um, and you know, the the rainforest connection example might be one. 
you know, those Huawei phones. I can't imagine that anybody working at Huawei would have ever suggested that they should be networked and into the rainforest in Brazil and use the audio to track, you know, illegal logging. So there's just, I think this is sort of the, just the beginning of where this could all be headed. Um, but if you have uh, ideas on, you know, what they might be used for or kind of novel ways, um, would love to, to hear about them. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for your question. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Again, feel free to leave it in the chat or just go ahead and uh, you know just speak out if you have any questions. Is anybody working on anything right now that they would be comfortable sharing or or talking about? Or is it all top secret? Yeah, so we have a, we are also launching the design challenge, um, I think later today at around uh, 5 p.m. Eastern um, with a couple of different like track options and everything like that. So hopefully with that announcement of the challenge that kind of sparks people to come up with a couple of different ideas related to um, some of the nonprofits that we have partnered with. Um, so hopefully um, tomorrow when judging starts, though, we'll be able to see like the full picture of some cool ideas that people have come up with. That's great. Um, I mean, one thing I would say about, you know, the, the opportunity that, that something like ID8 offers uh, to you all is to collaborate in that sort of more, uh, you know, intimate way, if you will, um, and, and so much freedom and flexibility and just experimentation um, to see what works. Um, companies like Huawei, uh, or Google, or Apple, or whoever, um, you know, allowing for those ideas uh, to bubble up or across or wherever they need to go within the organization um, is, of course, an organizational challenge that is, you know, any big company needs to manage properly um, to incorporate the idea of inclusion, to elevate the right ideas, uh, to ensure that people are being heard. Uh, with their concerns or their, um, you know, whatever it is that's motivating them to push for something. Um, you know, this is all what bigger companies face. But when you're starting out, you know, uh, if it's a, a, a group of you that's thinking about uh, a concept or an idea or uh, a company or whatever it is, there's just so much, um, you know, opportunity to really dig into all of that and go as sort of wide and deep as you want to. Um, and I would just, you know, encourage you all to really let your imaginations run free and don't feel like you need to be constricted by, by anything you've seen in the past. You know, uh, don't, you know, limit yourself to following certain trends or what you think is going to appeal to people or, you know, what's going to make a bunch of money. Because I think those can be the wrong motivations, certainly in the beginning. Of course, companies need to think about their revenue over time to be sustainable. But in the beginning, really doing something, and even if it's something that feels kind of niche, uh, you know, for a certain segment of the population that really, really needs what you're thinking about, will allow you to create a, a future for yourselves, a, uh, a job, let's call it, or an income, or a project, or, you know, whatever it is that you want to focus on. And if you have a, an audience who really believes in your design uh, ethos and what you're committed to and the framework around that, it's, it's, I, it's contagious, you know, it, it, in a good way, not like the, not like coronavirus, but in a way that really draws people in. Um, and so don't, I would say, I guess my, you know, advice, if you will, is just to let that sort of inner self uh, within you, uh, now I'm starting to sound old or something, but um, let that inner self sort of come out. Don't, don't hold back. Um, and as much as possible, listen to what other people are telling you um, about whatever it is that you're doing. And I don't mean, you know, uh, your professors necessarily or investors or something like that, but your peers and, you know, people who you're thinking about as your contemporaries, um, as you're innovating for this generation or the next one. Cool. Uh, 
Uh, any other questions? I had another quick question. So I know you talked a lot about the technologies that Huawei is working on, sound, like especially with the different applications for the technologies, like what you're talking about with Rainforest Connection. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about what are some of the most exciting technologies, whether or not they're developed by Huawei right now that you envision being really big in the future? Well, thank you for asking, uh, Athena. I, um, you know, I, I would, uh, I've wrestled with, with virtual reality and, and VR. Um, not that it isn't uh, an exciting and of course immersive experience for people. Um, and Huawei does offer a number of different ways to engage with that, including games and, um, you know, educational reasons and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, but I, I sort of feel like maybe AR is, is kind of where it's at in the near future, if, if we can all kind of figure out what the right reasons are to develop something in AR. So, you know, as an example, um, I, in, in some days, I want to say this is before the pandemic, but when I was walking around, say, Manhattan, I was imagining how awesome it would be to see an AR uh, experience of what a neighborhood looked like before. So you could use your phone to kind of layer over and appreciate, you know, well, appreciate and maybe be aware of the development uh, that's happened in different neighborhoods. Is this the, the way that it should go? Um, you know, what was there in the past? What can we learn from that? Um, so I think there are ways that, that AR is a little less, a little less intrusive in people's lives. I'm just not sure that, you know, as a, as a social norm, we're all quite ready to wear, you know, vision constricting headsets that, that don't allow us necessarily to leave the home. Um, whereas something like AR you can use when you're out in the world, again, you know, you don't of course want to have it right in front of you and you don't want to walk into somebody and you don't want it to be distracting and you don't want to do it while you're driving. And, you know, there are all these things to consider, but I just think that something like augmented reality, even the definition of it, augmenting your reality, um, rather than sort of taking it over, um, to me feels like there's still a lot of untapped potential there. Um, and you know, whether it's by wearing, uh, glasses or it's through your phone, um, you know, whatever it is, I think there's a ton of potential there to think about it. Not just from a, again, not just from like a Pokemon go, uh, go out and, and kind of play a game in the world way, but from a, what is, uh, beneficial to society and, and, to our topic here today, what is helping with inclusivity? You know, what is it we can learn um, through AR experiences? Um, you know, there's a, I'll just give one more example. There's um, a company called StoryFile, which is, ha has been working on creating holograms of uh, Holocaust uh, survivors. And in the Illinois Holocaust Museum, you can actually go in and interact with a survivor from the Holocaust um, in this kind of AR interactive way. And th to me, that is a, and, and they've basically, the, the interactivity includes you asking these Holocaust survivors questions. What was it like uh, to be in a concentration camp? What was it like during the war? Uh, preserving all these stories, and then they will interact with you. Um, and some of the people they've actually spoken to since they started doing this between uh, story file and the Illinois Holocaust Museum, some of those people have actually passed away. So these are really the uh, kind of like a, a time capsule, if you will, of these people's stories. So what are the ways that AR can help to represent an avatar, somebody from the past, somebody who can help us to learn? Um, you know, there are, I think, some really exciting directions that, that all of this is going to go in the future. Oh, that sounds incredible. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. And then I think there might be a couple other items in the chat as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, so from Aditya, um, this may seem unrelated. Huawei has received a series of bans in Western countries. How have you managed to work around this? So there are a, a number of different ways that that Huawei is adapting to um, the, the different sort of geopolitical forces that are at play. Um, you know, and I would go back to um, what I was alluding to in the beginning around investing in R&D. And that, you know, for, for Huawei to really think about um, ensuring that the sustainability of Huawei 
um, is a direct result of investing in, in us, in itself, and being able to uh, go forward without, um, you know, without, uh, you know, but of course admitting that there have been challenges um, as part of all of this. Um, and, um, you know, there are plenty of uh, discussions that are going on and understanding the supply chain and semiconductors and where does this all fit into um, innovating? Um, you know, we believe in a collaborative and, and innovative approach to technology and see benefits for uh, people no matter where they live. And that is how Huawei started. Um, and how it continues. So ideally we can get to a place where that type of approach is uh, more possible and there are benefits to uh, everybody involved, whether it's about jobs, whether it's about uh, infrastructure, um, whether it's about the social issues we were talking about earlier, addressing education, healthcare, um, uh, economic challenges, um, the environment. Um, you know, we're, we're a global society and I think that, you know, uh, having a, an isolationist view is just, uh, it, to me, it feels um, that that is just no longer uh, the way that the world is headed, um, you know, and that is partly due to uh, all kinds of factors from travel to learning more about each other, wherever we live, to uh, simply being connected more through the internet. And the fact that the products we use today come from a variety of different places around the world and not even just the product itself, but everything in it. Um, and I think that, you know, many of us are not aware of, you know, where did all of the components come from with our individual smartphones? Probably be surprised to sort of, you know, unpack it and see the, the supply chain of where all of this comes from in order for us to appreciate everything technology affords for us. So I, I think we're, we're hopeful um, that we can continue to um, to move forward in that uh, collaborative spirit. Awesome, thank you. Uh, any other last questions? Um, again, free, free, feel free to send it in the chat or just unmute yourself. Um, if not, then I think um that should be good um actually i can have a quick question just generally speaking for this conference if you had like a piece of advice to give all of our participants here today what would it be mm. a piece of advice boy raymond thank you for allowing me to impart any advice it's uh <laughs> My daughters well, don't, don't often want to listen to me when I share any advice with them, but no, that's not true. Um, but no, I, you know, in all seriousness, I think that, you know, I, I, I can't really see everybody on the, on the call or of course who will be, you know, viewing or listening later. Um, but as somebody who is, um, I'm, I'm guessing more than a few years older uh, than, than all of you, I would say that, you know, the opportunity to, design and create for the future that you want um, and, and what the world needs is possible at a micro level as much as a macro level. So I think, you know, people like to say sort of think, think globally and act locally, right? So it's easy to get carried away with sort of a big idea and think, oh, it's just gonna change the world. It's gonna be this huge company. It's gonna do this and that, and it might. Um, and that's exciting to think about. On the other hand, I think there's just as much value in focusing on a local challenge, designing for people who need whatever it is that you are passionate about, um, and being your authentic self in applying any of your uh, intellectual capacity and um, to solving that. And um, on the inclusivity side, I just think that, you know, I'm personally excited about where the world is headed. Uh, I have had the opportunity to travel to close to 70 countries and uh, it has been a humbling experience to encounter people of all shapes and sizes and income levels and demographics and you name it. And I think that the fact that we're all in this together um, is something that can be infused into your design process. But again, not, not 
worrying too much about is this going to become the next Huawei or the next Apple or the next Google or the next whatever, but more importantly, is this going to impact the life of one person? And let's start with that one human being who will benefit from whatever it is that you're designing and then kind of go out from there. And that, speaking from experience, is in and of itself incredibly rewarding. And I'm going to say over the long term of your life in technology or in design or whatever it is that you're into, far more beneficial to your sense of self and purpose and kind of the the spark of, of what it is that you want to do with yourself than any amount of money will ever provide for you. So I guess that's my little long-winded bit of advice, Raymond. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, uh, for, you know, taking the time out of your busy schedule, um, as well as, you know, sharing your background and also just giving us um, a lot of good advice for um, the design challenge and moving forward in general, just, um, you know, how can we design for good and everything like that. So, um, yeah, with that being said, thank you all for coming. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you all at some of our next speaker events uh, starting on the hour, as well as at our design challenge, which begins at 5 p.m. Eastern. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks yeah. to the Hack 2 ID8 team. Yeah, thank you so much, Thanks, everyone, for, for speaking to us today. You bet. Bye-bye.